short while she'll be making a crossing unless the Lord gives her a miracle and uh, you know there's some things about divine healing that I really don't understand I don't understand how you can have two sick people you pray the same prayer and you see one healed and you see one not but I've resided to the fact that I'm not God he knows what he's doing and he makes no mistakes but because one doesn't get healed, I'm not going to quit believing God for healing in the future. Because ultimately, her ultimate healing will come in just, a, in just a short little while. Amen. Believing that God, amen, is going to carry her through. And so we need to pray for the Suggs family uh, to move on, on this knee. Um, yet and still, got a call last night from uh, Sister Joyce Roberts, and we've been praying for her. I've told her, I said, if there's a modern day Joe Bet, she's it. Because it seems like he has one hit after another uh, from her health. You, you know her story, but she called me last night. She said, well, I got some good news. And normally when she calls, it's not good news. So that took me by surprise. She said, I went to the doctor this week. She said, they did more scans and my cancer is half gone. I said, well, praise the Lord. She was so happy and excited. She said, the Lord's answering our prayers. I said, he is. But we're going to believe for the other half to be gone as well. Amen. For God to move, for God to touch. So we need to continue to remember her and our prayers. Amen. Brother Glenn, uh, we prayed for him. Amen. And uh, was having some, some health issues. I believe God heard a prayer. And he's with us this morning. Amen. So I thank God for that. And uh, I know that there's a multitude of needs in this house. Amen, that are here, um, that uh, we know the miracle worker. And we know the one that is able to meet the needs. And I believe this morning that you can leave here with your need met. You can leave here with God uh, stepping on the scene and doing the work that only he can do. And uh, you can leave here saying, amen, I know my God can do it. Amen. Thank you again to everybody that's here. We're going to allow our children's church to be dismissed. Sister Michelle is going to be taking them. If you have your Bibles and will turn with us to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. I'm going to read one verse of scripture there for the sake of time. But uh, we're going to go back to the book of Ezra and be preaching mainly from Ezra chapter number 3 and Ezra chapter number 4. Uh, but for the sake of time, we'll just read the one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11. Amen. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say hold on. I guess we're there. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11. Paul writing to the church and said, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. I want to draw your attention to the last part. Of verse number 11 says, For we are not ignorant of his devices. I want to preach that the Lord will help me for a few minutes on Satan's strategy against the church. 
Satan's strategy against the church. We have an enemy. We know who it is. And he has a strategy against us. But I believe we can find in Scripture what that strategy is. And I believe in Scripture we can find the strategy to out-strategize him. Amen. And I want the Lord to help us this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you for your spirit that we've been made to feel. You're in this house. And I'm asking, oh God, as the lot has fallen for the preaching of the word, that you would anoint us to preach what you've laid upon our hearts. God, I'd help me communicate clearly, confidently, and concisely what you have given unto me. Oh God, I need you. I need your anointing this morning. Anoint us to hear and to respond. I pray that by your spirit, you would illuminate your word unto us. And I pray that by your spirit, you touch our hearts and our lives in a way that only you can. Father, to the end result, the lost would be saved. Sick could be healed. God, those that are seeking the baptism could be filled. And we're going to give you the honor, the glory, the praise for it all. In Jesus' holy name we pray it. And the church says amen. Amen. And amen. Satan's strategy against the church. Paul was writing to the church of Corinth. And he warned them to be on guard. He warned them about their adversary. And he told them we're not ignorant concerning his devices. Paul was writing and he said we know who our adversary is and we know how he works. We know his plans, his thoughts, his skill. He said we're not ignorant of the great number of strategies in which he uses consistently and constantly. Using to injure us to destroy the souls of people. And he said the church at all times has been subjected to the influence, to the wiles of the devil, as well as uh, not only the corporate church, but individual believers and Christians. And he warned the church, therefore, to be on guard, constantly on guard against these snares. Amen. As we look at Satan's strategy, it's often repetitive. How he moved in the Bible is oftentimes how he moves today. He may use different devices uh, against us, for instance, uh, th th he has more technology at his, uh, at his disposal today than what he had in biblical times. But his overall scheme is still the same. He has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Amen. That's, that's his ultimate goal. That has not changed through the, the centuries. Amen. The sin that we battle is the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That has not changed. Amen. We may have different devices that he has at his disposal today through various mechanisms, but the overall scheme has not changed. And if we were to go back and we were to look biblically in the book of Ezra, I believe that we can see Satan's end time strategy against the church. Amen. In full array. We find in, in Ezra chapter number 3. That uh, the, the children of Israel, they're coming back from Babylonian captivity. A, a small group of them, a man by the name of Zerubbabel, he uh, petitions the king to, to go back and to rebuild the temple of the Lord that had been burned and, and broken down. And uh, he begins to get everything together and he leaves uh, uh, this place in Assyria and he comes back uh, into the, uh, the land of Israel. And in verse number 9 of Ezra 3, uh, he begins working with Jeshua. He gets the Levites together. And in verse number 10, the Bible says that when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, that they set priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of King David. They're, they're rebuilding the temple of the Lord. They begin to sing. And praise the Lord and give thanks unto the Lord because he is good and his mercy endures forever towards Israel. They sang the same song then that they sang at Solomon's dedication of the temple. They were going right in line and in order the second temple with the first. And they begin to shout with a great shout. They praise the Lord because the foundation of the house was laid. And we find in verse number 12 that many of the priests and the Levites of the chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes that they wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. 
so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Folks, these people were having church. They were rejoicing. They were praising the Lord. They're rebuilding the temple of the Lord. They're having camp meeting. They're lifting their voice. They're shouting. Now there's two groups of people, and I don't want to get too far into this, but you had the older ones that were weeping because they remembered the first temple. They remembered the work that was done. They remembered for its glory, its majesty, and its beauty. And they see the second temple being built. And the, the, the beauty of it physically wasn't the same as the first temple. So they weeped, began to weep as they saw that. But you had another generation that had never seen the temple. They had never had a place to offer sacrifice unto God. So while one generation was weeping about memories of the past, you had another generation that was excited about the prospect of the future. But when both of them come together, they had church. My God, did they have church. They shouted with a great joy. They're experiencing the victory. God's presence is there. Amen. The glory filled the house. And the Bible said that the noise was heard afar off. I wish that we could have that type of church this morning where we get the victory and all of Magnolia Springs and Foley can hear us shouting and having church. Can you say amen? That'd be all right with me. Amen. If the Holy Ghost would just come down in such a way uh, and the glory of God would fill the house. Uh, amen. And somebody lets out a great shout. Uh, amen. Where the magnolia springs, uh, more and dive. Uh, when they heard it, uh, amen, they could hear it far off. Uh, amen. The people of God shouting uh, and having church. Uh, amen. What a glorious time uh, that would be. Uh, amen. When they begin to shout, uh, people begin to hear it uh, and take note. Uh, something is happening. At the church. I would to God, amen, that when we begin to shout, amen, that people can say something's happening down at the church. Hallelujah. Something's happening down at the church. Amen. We see in chapter number three, camp meeting. We see revival. We see the beginning of the temple, the foundation being laid. Amen. And it got the people's attention. Amen. And not only did it get people's attention, it got the devil's attention. Chapter three, we see the reassembling of the Jews, which is a type and a foreshadowing of the church. But in chapter 4, we see the beginning of an all-out assault from hell to hinder the progress of God's people. We see a strategy of Satan as it begins to unfold. unfold. Uh, let's look at that strategy this morning in verse number 1 uh, of Ezra 4. It says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, that they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers. It didn't take the devil long. Amen. Just one verse of scripture later. From them shouting with a great shout. Uh, and a noise being abroad. Uh, amen. God's doing something at the church. Uh, amen. In verse number one of chapter number four. Uh, we see the adversary poke up his head. We see the adversary. Amen. Who were the adversaries? The adversaries here were the people of Samaria or the Samaritans. I don't have time to get into all the biblical history here. But when the Assyrians came and invaded the northern tribes of Israel, they took all the rulers. They took all the upper class. They took all the workers. And they left the poor. They left the ignorant. They left those of a lower estate. They left those. And they dispersed them amongst the, the surrounding nations because they were of no value. Amen. To the, to the king of Assyria. So they, they scattered. And that people that was of Jewish ancestry, of Jewish lineage, who knew about Jehovah, who knew about all of his works, they began to intermarry and to intertwine with the neighboring villages and the neighboring nations. Amen. Which was a direct contradiction to the law of God. They weren't supposed to do that. So now what you have is a mixed breed, a mixture of a group of people that have the foundation 
of Judaism that have the foundation of the worship of the one true God. Amen. But now they're of mixed blood. Now they're of mixed race. Now they're of mixed culture. But most importantly, they're of mixed religion. Because when they begin to intermarry, they begin to take on the gods of the world around them. They had the foundation and the knowledge of who the one true God was. Uh, but they had the mentality, we're going to go along to get along. Uh, we're going to uh, take on the gods that would benefit us. Uh, so they knew how to worship Jehovah, but they also knew how to worship Baal. Uh, they also knew how to worship uh, the Assyrian gods and the pagan gods. Uh, amen. Uh, and they were a just all the way around from religion to race to culture. They were a mixed breed uh, of people. Uh, amen. So so when the, the temple is being rebuilt, uh, and then when they, they come in and they say, hey, what's going on? Zerubbabel says, we're here to rebuild the temple. The ad, that, that's when the Bible called them uh, an adversary because when they came to him, they said, uh, let us build the temple with you. Let us build the temple with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we sacrificed since the days of Eshadon, the king of Asher, which brought us up hither. Amen. We know about Jehovah. We pray to him. We sacrifice to him. Amen. But we, we, we pray to all the other gods too. But if you'll just let us in, if you'll let us be a part, we will work with you. Notice what they said. For we will build with you. In this, we see the strategy number one of Satan is assimilation. Amen. To, to assimilate means to become part of, uh, amen, a group, a country, or society, uh, or it simply means to mix. To mix. Amen. You see, the adversary, uh, amen, which were uh, a mixed breed group of people uh, who had a uh, mixed uh, religion, uh, amen, that were both contrary to the law and the commandments of God. Uh, they said, let us join what you're doing. Uh, and the enemy took the approach uh, that if we can't beat them, join them. If we can't stop them, uh, then let's get in. Uh, amen. In the same way we have been polluted, uh, let us pollute uh, and corrupt the work of God. Uh, amen. If we can't stop the temple from being built, uh, let's corrupt it. Uh, let's pollute it. Uh, let's do everything that we can. Uh, amen. To try to mix this thing up. Uh, and, and if we know anything in Scripture, we know that God uh, hates uh, a mixture. I don't have time to preach all this this morning. Uh, amen. But you go back to that Levitical law. Uh, they couldn't even mix uh, rows of the garden. Uh, if one row started a P, a P row, uh, it, it had to all be a P row. Uh, amen. If one was a row of corn, uh, you couldn't mix uh, half pea, half corn. Uh, you couldn't mix half tomato, half green beans. No, what you start with uh, is how you finish it. Uh, you couldn't mix clothes. Uh, you couldn't be half cotton and half polyester. Uh, it had to be 100 percent pure. Uh, amen. Why? Because there was a spiritual principle there. Uh, God does not like mixtures. Uh, amen. God does not want uh, the world and the spirit to be mixed. Uh, God doesn't want the church uh, and the world to be mixed. Uh, he wants us to be a city on a hill that stands out uh, and stands out. Uh, he wants us to be salt uh, and light. Uh, not a watered down mixture uh, because if the salt loses its savor, what's it good for? Uh, when you mix salt with something else, uh, it changes the characteristic uh, and the nature of the product. Uh, and God doesn't want that. Uh, he wants purity. Hallelujah. Amen. How are we going to worship God? Uh, we worship him in purity of spirit uh, and of truth. Uh, amen. But the strategy of Satan uh, is to create a mixture uh, that's a counterfeit uh, and a knockoff of what's pure uh, and what's right. And folks, I can tell you the same way. That the Zerubbabel had an adversary. We have an adversary this morning. Peter wrote about it and said, be vigilant and sober because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. What is his plot? Amen. His first plot is to assimilate the world into the church. And the second plot is to assimilate different religions into the church. I got one that's right and one amen. But can I tell you the reason why spiritually speaking the church is in the state she's in this morning 
For too long, Brother Joey, there's been a mixture going on. There's been a mixture. Just a little bit here and just a little bit there. Taking on this of the world uh, and that of the world. Uh, and what's happening? It's changing the product uh, from the pure religion and undefiled uh, to a corrupt uh, amalgamation, a mixture that God uh, never intended. Uh, and then when our worship services look like uh, a rock and roll concert, uh, because we've taken this element from the world uh, and said we can incorporate it into the church uh, and make it better. Uh, I'm not against modernization of the church, uh, but when it mixes the product uh, and and it changes the outcome. I mean, somebody's got to stand up against it. God always has hated a mixture. And God will always hate a mixture. I mean, we must go back to the purity of the gospel. The purity, I mean, of loving the Lord thy God with all the heart, all the mind, all the soul, and all the strength. Again, not against modernization. But if modernization corrupts the end product of the gospel, we've made a mixture that God will not honor. Is it any wonder why you have, yeah, I'm going to name drop this morning, Mr. Warren from California with a mixture of Christianity and Islam, what he's labeling as Chrislam, a joining of the religions. What is it? That is a strategy of Satan. What about this coexist movement? How many of you have seen those bumper stickers on the back of cars that has about a hundred different religious symbols on there? Let's just coexist. Let's just take from Confucius and Buddha and Allah. Amen. And Mohammed uh, and Abraham uh, and Jesus. Uh, amen. Pentecost. Uh, let's take all of this together and let's form our own religion. Uh, let's just coexist. Let's take uh, uh, what we like. Uh, amen. And let's just live it out uh, and be a better existence. Listen, folks. Uh, that is not uh, the gospel. Uh, that is an end time strategy of Satan uh, to pollute and to corrupt uh, the word of God. Uh, there is but one way into the city. Uh, and Jesus said, I... Uh, and the way, the truth, and the life. If any man comes in any other way, he is the same as a thief and a robber. Allah won't get you to heaven. My God. Buddha won't get you to heaven. Confucius won't get you there. Jesus is the way. My God. And we've got to maintain the truth and the integrity of his gospel. But you watch this coexist movement. And you watch this mixture. It's picking up steam and traction. I know we're in the Bible Belt. I know it seems far-fetched for us. But all you have to do is to look at the book of Revelation. What is it? There is a one-world government. And there is a one-world religion. What's it going to be? I believe, Brother Clint, it's going to be a mixture. It's going to be a little bit from everywhere. It's going to make the Muslim happy. It's going to make the, the lukewarm Christian. Hey, the, the church is going to be gone, but those that still subscribe to the teaching uh, of the church, uh, it'll make them happy. It'll tickle their fancy. It won't offend uh, or buck the trend uh, or buck the system for anybody. It's going to be a mixture uh, of a world religion. Uh, amen. I can tell you that is an end time strategy that we're seeing. Uh, the first fruits of right now, uh, but it's only going to get worse. Too much to preach to park out right here. But you better be careful to trust not every spirit. To trust not every and be moved not by every wind of doctrine out there. But try the spirits and see whether they be of God or not. Because I can tell you there is a Holy Spirit at work. But there's millions of unholy spirits that are out there. And you better be careful what spirit you listen to. I mean, there's a lot of people saying, well, the Spirit led me. Uh, I mean, the question is, which Spirit led you? Uh, because if He's leading you to do something contrary to the Word of God, uh, it's not the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's not the third person of the child you Godhead. Because uh, He's going to lead you and guide you into truth. Uh, amen. What is truth? Uh, truth is not a thing. Uh, truth is a person. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, uh, the truth, and the life. Uh, if that Spirit uh, leads you to do anything outside of the Word of God, uh, then it's not holy. Holy, uh, and it's not of God, uh, but it's an unholy spirit birthed in hell uh, to mix uh, and corrupt the 
truth of the incorruptible gospel. But Zerubbabel tells us how to deal with that strategy. And verse number three. Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build the house of our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as the king uh, Cyrus, uh, king of Persia, hath uh, commanded us. Uh, amen. What was he doing? He was resisting the uh, strategy of assimilation. He was resisting the strategy. Uh, amen. Don't you know they called him an old fogey? Uh, don't you know they called him a holy roller? Uh, don't you know that they called him old fashioned? They said, you've got to modernize. Uh, and you got to get with the times. Uh, amen. But J Zerubbabel said, you didn't call me. Uh, and you can't stop me. Uh, amen. I'm not going to join myself to something that's contrary to what God uh, has ordained. Uh, we need some Zerubbabels in this day and hour that will stand up. Uh, and willing to be labeled as different. Uh, willing to be labeled is hard. that will be a salmon and swim upstream against the mainstream and say I'm protecting what God has gifted me. I'm protecting what God has called me to do. I refuse to let there be a mixture. I refuse to corrupt the incorruptible gospel. Amen. But I am going to resist. The first strategy is that of assimilation. And if the devil can't get you to assimilate and allow him to join your forces, he's going to move forward to his next strategy. And that is to attack the work of your hands. You read it for yourself. In verse number three, Zerubbabel said, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to refuse to assimilate. And he said it immediately went into verse 4. Then the people of the land, the adversaries again, weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in their building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. We see three things specifically, three strategies within the strategy that the enemy did. The first thing that we can see is that they weakened their hands. Now, this is an interesting phrase. It is figurative as well as literal. It's figurative in the, the sense that this is a Hebrew idiom for discouragement. You see, when you attempt a work for God, you can expect at some point in time that you are going to face discouragement. I hate to be Debbie Downer this morning. Amen. But there's going to be some times where you are discouraged in your work for the Lord. And you've got to realize where. That discouragement comes from. Uh, amen. It comes from the adversary that's trying to stop the work of the Lord. So if you feel discouraged this morning in your walk with the Lord, what do you do? You better keep walking. If you feel discouraged in your work for the Lord, you better keep working. If you feel discouraged in your worship of the Lord, don't you quit. Keep on worshiping. Because that's what the devil is discouraging you, uh, trying to get you to stop walking, uh, trying to get you to stop worshiping, uh, trying to get you to stop working. Uh, I mean, you've got to realize uh, his strategy. What does he attack with with discouragement? Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says that he troubled them in building. If you study that word troubled out, that word troubled, in its original Hebrew translation, this is the only time in Scripture that you will find this word used. It's the only time that you'll find. And it is literally, literally interpreted to be terrified. So, when you read it in its original context, the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah, and they terrified them in their building. He struck at the workers of God with what? A spirit of intimidation and a spirit of fear. Matthew Henry says that they weakened the hands by telling them that it was in vain to attempt this work, calling them foolish, 
they began. Uh, they were not able to complete what they began. And by their insinuations, they troubled them. They terrified them. And many, when they heard the fearful sayings of their adversaries, they quit and went home. All it took was a vain, empty threat that was enough to stop the half-hearted worker. All it took was one vain little threat and many became fearful and quit. Amen. I'm seeing that play out in the church. Amen. Because we are so close to the end of this thing, folks. Amen. Our journey is about over. But it's amazing how many people are quitting on the last leg of the journey. And you ask yourself, why? Amen. I believe a lot of it is fear because the Bible tells us in Luke 21, Jesus spoke this and he said that in the last days that men's hearts would fail them for fear and for looking at those things which are coming on the earth and for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. People, there's never been a more a time where anxiety has been higher. One out of every three individuals in the church suffers from fear and anxiety. What is it? It is a strategy of the enemy to take your eyes off of God and put them on your fears. It's a strategy for your life to be dictated by fear instead of guiding by the principle of your faith. It's a strategy, folks, the same way he attacks Zerubbabel and his workers with fear. He's attacking the church of the living God with an all-out assault of fear. But I've got good news. God has not given up. Uh, the spirit of fear uh, but the power uh, of love uh, and of a sound mind uh, you've got to call that for what it is uh, it's a spirit birthed in hell uh, to try to get you to stop walking, uh, working uh, and worshiping uh, but God says I've given you power uh, my God I feel the Holy Ghost uh, I've given you power uh, over that uh, it's time that we exercise our authority uh, and put that spirit back uh, where it belongs uh, and walk uh, in the presence Principle of faith. Fear. Attack in their hand. Fear. Second attack. Not only is this a work of terror, but this was a work of discouragement. Put yourself in Zerubbabel's shoes. He's got about a thousand more or less people that's working with him building this temple. And when his workers get fearful and quit, it's him and just a handful left to continue to work. Don't you think that was pretty discouraging? Don't you think that was awful discouraging? Not only do I see many in the church gripped with a spirit of fear today, for those that are continually working, I see a spirit of discouragement. Discouragement. I don't have time to preach all of that this morning, but I can tell you, folks, just like you're going to have to continue or overcome fear, there's going to be a point in time in your journey where you're going to have to overcome discouragement. There's going to be times where you might will have to walk this thing alone. There may be times where nobody goes with you. God's called you to do a work. And you're walking out that walk. And you think all the church should be behind you. And you're the only one doing the work. There's times where that gets discouraging. But can I tell you something? God didn't call the rest of the church. To do what he's called you to do. There's aspects of the gospel. There's aspects of the call that only you can carry out. And if you get discouraged and you throw up your hands and quit. Then your adversary has just won. Because if you don't do it. Nobody's going to do it. And if you quit. Then everyone else. Might as well just quit. There's got to be a point in time when you overcome fear. There's a point in time when you've got to overcome discouragement and say, I'm going to build this temple if I have to build it alone. A thousand may turn their backs and walk away. Amen. But that's just a thousand. 
amen, that's not going to enjoy the fruits, uh, amen, of my labor and the fruits of my success. Because uh, I'm going to keep on working for the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. David knew about this. Uh, you find himself awful discouraged at Ziglag. Uh, amen. When no fault of his own, the people stopped, thought of stoning him. Uh, his wives uh, had been taken. His children had been taken. Uh, all of his belongings had been stolen. Uh, his city had been struck, burned with fire. Uh, and all of the people thought of stoning him. You've heard that preached three times uh, right here in this pulpit over the last month. Uh, amen. But the Bible says that David, what? Encouraged himself in the Lord. Hallelujah. You're going to have days of discouragement uh, when the adversary is going to come against every facet of your soul. Uh, but there's got to be a point in time when you say, bring hither the ephod, uh, that priestly robe, uh, and you find yourself in the hidden place uh, of God's presence. Uh, and you just encourage yourself uh, in the Lord. Uh, it didn't say that the priest encouraged him. Uh, it didn't say that the pastor encouraged him. Uh, he didn't have a Sunday school teacher to encourage him. Uh, but he got along with God. Uh, and he encouraged uh, him himself in the Lord. If you're going to win the battle of discouragement, you're going to have to find a way to encourage yourself in the Lord. And I promise you, God's encouragement, my God, will always be greater than the devil's discouragement. If God be for you, amen, who can be against you? Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord because I'm not going to quit building the temple. I gotta hurry. Paul standing before Agrippa, awful discouraged for the crime of Christianity. You know what Paul responded to him? He said, King Agrippa, I think myself happy. You ain't making me happy. My circumstances ain't making me happy. Hallelujah. But I'm just going to think myself happy. I'm just going to make myself happy. Because you see, Paul had joy in his heart. Hallelujah. Paul had the joy, uh, the fruit of the working of the Spirit of God. Uh, and there was nothing that the adversary could do to take his joy. Uh, he was beaten, my God. Uh, he was stoned. Uh, he was shipwrecked. Uh, amen. He was abandoned uh, by those that he loved. Uh, amen. But all the while, uh, he had the Holy Ghost on the inside of him, uh, encouraging him. Uh, don't quit, Paul. Uh, don't stop here. Uh, amen. You might be discouraged today, uh, but there's a Holy Spirit uh, that'll encourage you. Uh, just think or happy. Amen. Just make yourself happy. Amen. And God can turn your discouragement into encouragement. Try to get them with fear. Try to get them with discouragement. And notice what the last portion of that verse says. That he hired counselors against them. To do what? To frustrate their purpose. That word frustrated in the original Hebrew means to question or to doubt. They begin to question their calling. Did God really tell me to do this? Did God really lead me to do this? Did I really hear from God? Kind of like Brother Eddie. The start of this church, bank account was empty. Pews were sparse for people in the pews. Heard him tell the story many times. Sister Barbara Williams asked him, did you really hear from God? He said, well, what make you think I didn't? She said, just two reasons, no people and no money. He said, well, pretty good reason to question and to consider if we're not careful, we'll allow the enemy to begin to talk to us. And we'll question our calling. We'll frustrate. We'll be frustrated in our purpose. And folks, if we lose our purpose, we've lost it all. If we lose our purpose, we've lost it all. It's what the enemy tried to do. Tried to frustrate them with the intent of making them quit and making void the calling of God. 
There's been a lot of questions that the devil has put in my mind. A lot of things I've heard him give me chirp in my ear from the first time that I started walking in the call of God. But for every discouraging word that he says, we can find encouragement in the word of God. The word of God tells us in Galatians, be not weary in well-doing. Don't get frustrated in your calling. Don't get frustrated in your purpose because you'll reap in due season if you thank God. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Zerubbabel could have quit. He could have got frustrated in his purpose. And threw up his hands and quit. Uh, amen. But he kept on building and he kept on working. Uh, amen. So when the devil begins to come at you. Uh, amen. Sunday school teacher and says. Uh, is it really working yet? You're teaching to the same uh, handful every Sunday morning. Uh, amen. Or your, your your class isn't experiencing any growth. Uh, keep teaching anyway. Uh, amen. Singer. Uh, amen. Is, is God really. Is God call me. Uh, keep singing anyway. Uh, musician. Uh, keep playing. Preacher. Keep preaching. Uh, lay person. Uh, amen. Amen. Keep ministering for the Lord. Uh, testify or keep testifying. Uh, you'll reap uh, in due season if you faint not. Uh, don't get frustrated in your purpose uh, and give up on God. My God. Uh, but sometimes you got to kick it down uh, in the four wheel drive uh, and you got to keep going when the keep going. Uh, amen. Doesn't want to keep going. Uh, amen. When everything tells you to stop, uh, put it in granny low. Uh, amen. And try to plow on through uh, because you'll reap uh, a hard in due season if you don't quit I'm hurrying with the last two points last two strategies of Satan he, when he couldn't get them with assimilation when he couldn't get them by attacking the works of their hands he sent accusations of wrongdoing their way you can read it for yourself in Ezra 4 11 through 16. But the adversaries, the Samaritans, they sent a letter back to the king. And they said, these people, amen, they're building, I love this, a rebellious and a bad city. That was their word back to their king. They're building a rebellious, they're rebellious people. And they're building a bad city. Can I tell you, when you follow the will and the ways of God, it's always going to be seen as rebellion to this world system. And in their eyes, they said, it's, it's a rebellious people. They're building a bad city. No, they're building a good city. But doesn't the Bible say that there's going to come a day when men are going to call evil good? And they're going to call good evil. What is that? That's a strategy of the adversary. When he comes against us and he tells us, oh, these are rebellious people. When they don't comply to government edicts. <laughs> when they don't shut down when they're supposed to shut down. They're rebellious uh, and they're doing a bad thing. No, uh, we're obedient uh, and we're doing a good thing. Uh, amen. We're not going to listen to your attacks. Uh, amen. And your strategies. Uh, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, you can falsely accuse us. Uh, amen. You can label us what we will. Uh, amen. But as long as we're labeled good and faithful in the eyes of God, uh, as long as we hear him say, well done, uh, call me what you will. Uh, but when he calls me, uh, you can call me gone. They said false accusations. Now I know I can't park out here long. I can't preach all day. I would if you let me, but you ain't going to let me. <laughs> they sent false accusations their way. I know there's a lot of junk out there that calls itself Christian. But when you start hearing accusations against the remnant, you better consider the source. Because there are lots of lying spirits out there that wants to do everything to tear down the work of God. And the devil 
And I'm convinced. Amen. There's people that he works through that would rather climb Mount Everest to tell a lie than to stand flat-footed and tell the truth. So when you hear things, amen, consider the source and realize that hell has an agenda with everything that it does. Accusations, the devil said, if I can't stop them with assimilation, I'm going to attack their hands. And if attacking their hands don't work, I'll just send false accusations. Man, I'll lie on them. And you want to know what that caused? That caused an alliance with the government. King said, we're going to stop the work of the Lord. For 14 years, Brother Joey, no work was done on the temple. Outside of the foundations being laid. Outside of the foundation, that was it. An alliance came with the government and said, if you're not going to be a rebellious and a build a bad city, which was a blatant lie from the adversary, said, you're not going to do that, but you're going you're to stop. So at the end of chapter number four of Ezra, we see that the cease, then cease the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased into the second year. The reign of Darius, king of Persia. This attack brought them to their knees and for 14 years the work stopped. Folks, this is where the enemy wants to get you. To stop working for the Lord. Stop working for the cause of the Lord. Amen. I don't have time to get in. to go. I don't want anything to be seen as political. Amen. But don't you think for two seconds that what happened four years ago wasn't a dry run to what they want to do to the church. Shut them down. Don't gather. The abortion clinics can stay open. The liquor store can stay open. The methadone clinic can stay open, but it's illegal for the church to gather. Then when the church gathers, put limitations uh, on the number of people that can show up. Uh, and you can have 25, uh, but you can't sing uh, and don't preach real loud. Uh, that would shut Bible way down right there. I've been labeled a lot of loud mouth preachers. Been one of them, I can tell you. Amen. But what was an alliance with the government to try to shut down uh, the church but thank God, uh, amen, for men across this land that couldn't be silenced uh, amen, thank God for Christians uh, that wouldn't be stopped uh, while many cowered down to the threats of Satan uh, there were some who didn't uh, there were some who knew their purpose and said I'm not going to let uh, the enemy triumph, uh, I'm not going to let uh, the adversary stop us uh, and we kept going for the Lord uh, amen, there's got to be times where you do the same, uh, amen, you got to keep going uh, when keep going isn't easy uh, when you got to realize the attack uh, amen and the the, uh, the 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 attack and the strategy uh, of the adversary uh, but you got to realize there is a god in heaven uh, that's greater than our adversary uh, amen there's a god uh, in heaven uh, who says vengeance uh, is mine uh, and he will avenge uh, the elect hallelujah folks we have an adversary uh, he has a strategy uh, but my god uh, has an agenda and his agenda has not stopped and his agenda is always going to triumph I'm not going to be sidetracked by the working of the enemy but I'm going to be encouraged by the working of my God and no matter what we got to have the mentality we are going to keep going and we will rebuild this temple three things I'm going to leave you with this if we're going to overcome Satan's strategies We've got to get reconnected with our purpose. We've got to remember who called us and who sent us out to work. Did our adversary or did God? And if God called us and the adversary didn't, then why are you going to let the adversary stop you? He didn't call you and he can't stop you. Hallelujah. Amen. The second thing we've got to do is what Zerubbabel did. Amen. He got tired of the work of the temple not being undone. So you know what he did, Brother Jonathan? He went back and found the original letter from the king that said, not only are you going to be able to rebuild the temple, I'm going to provide you the timber. 
I'm going to provide you the resources. I'm going to give you the gold. Amen. And all the treasuries that were originally in the house. I'm going to give it unto you to restock and to refurbish the house. Amen. And he, amen, in chapter number 5, he and Jeshua got tired of sitting around doing nothing. They found the original letter, the original order from the king. And you know what they did? They picked up their hammers and they went back to work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They picked up the hammers. It might just be two or three, but they remembered we're under orders for the king. The king gave us authority. The king gave us approval. So we're not going to let some little magistrate stop us, but we're going to keep walking in our purpose. Hallelujah. Church, you've got to realize you're under a mandate from the king. God has called you where you are. God has put you where you are. Amen. And the devil wouldn't be much of a devil if he wouldn't try to stop the work of God. Amen. But it's time to go back to day one of your calling and remember your purpose. Remember who called you. Remember who commissioned you to service. It's time to pick up the hammer. It's time to pick up the sword. It's time to pick up the shield and to keep fighting the good fight of faith. We've got to get reconnected to our purpose. We've got to realize we're under a mandate tonight from the king. And the third thing. You started. With over a thousand. Went to just a handful. Fourteen years later. It was an even smaller batch. But brother Clint. When they remembered their purpose. They did not stop. Until the job was done. They did not stop. Until the job was done. All the chirping. All the attacking of the enemy. Did nothing but fuel them to complete their God-given task. Hallelujah. And 20 years later, 20 years later, what should have just taken them a couple of years, it took them 20. But at the end of the day, God's will was done. God's will was done. They were triumphant. And God was glorified. Amen, folks. We have an adversary. His strategy for us is the same as the strategy for them. But Zerubbabel overcame. You and I must overcome. Kirsten, come help me. I'm done. Listen, the church is not going to be defeated. You hear me loud this morning. The church is not going to be defeated. There may be a lot that fall by the wayside. But the remnant is not going down. She's about to go up. <laughs> Hallelujah. And can I tell you what happens to our adversary in the book of Revelation chapter number 20? He's released for a short season after the thousand year millennial reign. Amen. But we find his end in Revelation 20 verse number 10 when he's cast into the lake of fire forever and our adversary is destroyed. And you read on down into Revelation 21 where there's a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. And who's there? With good God Almighty. We find the church, the remnant, the blood bought. Amen. So while the devil is frying, the church is thriving. I'm going to say that again. While the devil is frying, the church is thriving. We're not going to be defeated. Amen. We're not going down. But soon and very soon, we're about to go up at the last trump of God. We're going to get out of here. We're going to go home. Amen. And through all of eternity, we're going to be ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't quit. That's what the adversary is trying to stop. That's what he's trying to get to cease. Amen. But you Keep working. Amen. Keep praying. Keep reading. Keep seeking. Keep working. Amen. While he's frying, you're going to be thriving. Stand with me all over the building. I'm done. That's Satan's strategy against the church. That's his plan and that's his working. But the plan and the work and the will of God always is going to reign supreme. Amen. He may be attacking you. Amen. I can tell you certainly. He's been talking to me. He's been trying to stop this church. But this church, she's not going down. Hallelujah. Amen. We're not going to be a weak, anemic body that just barely survives. Amen. But I believe the church 
the remnant. Amen. We, we were birthed in fire. We're going to leave here in fire. Amen. We were birthed in glory. We're going to leave in glory. We were birthed, amen, in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, doing wonders and miracles as God allowed. And we're going to leave here in a season of revival. Don't listen to the strategy of the adversary. Don't listen to the strategy of Satan. But God has a plan. God has a purpose. Amen. And God's moving. Give heed to his purpose, his will, his strategy. Keep building Keep laboring, keep working. Sooner or later, we'll hear him say, well done. Amen, church. Could you find your place to pray this morning if you're here and you're not saved? Amen. The devil, the adversary, has stopped you before you can even get started. What a day to give your heart and life to God. What a day to quit listening to the lies of the enemy and get born again. Hallelujah. Amen. If you're seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the adversary will do everything to discourage you get you to make you quit but he's the liar and the father of all lies the baptism is for you the glory of God is for you <laughs> amen you need a miracle in your body the enemy says just give up and quit there's no use in praying anymore amen I would double down even more and seek the face of God harder amen for your miracle is on the way to the church amen it seems like we're taking an all out of salt on every side Keep working. Yeah.